<coughs> yeah, hello everyone. <coughs> So, <clears throat> hello, good evening everyone. So, <clears throat> I think uh, this is a continuation class of the previous ENT that we have discussed here on that day. And uh, uh, <clears throat> due to some te technical uh, malfunctioning last week, it was not possible. So, now in this class, we will start with the larynx first and then we'll go towards the nose later on okay so so if audio visual is fine we will start the class is that fine audio visual is fine just confirm that so we'll start the larynx class fine so okay fine so let us start the class now coming to uh, the larynx just a minute okay <clears throat> so coming to larynx so larynx is also famously called as your voice box right okay larynx is also called as your voice box because the voice is produced from the larynx you know the structures the Structural unit uh, that produces voices vocal cords sensory organ that produces voices larynx, right? So the larynx to describe it is a Fibrocartilaginous structure, okay Fibrocartilaginous no bony elements here all the cartilages and ligaments will together arranged in a pattern and they form the larynx so a total of nine cartilages are there in the larynx of which three are paired and three are unpaid so you don't worry about the notes doctors so all the notes entire notes in a clear legible way will be provided to you concentrate on the class try to understand the topic so that it will be easy it will be easy once you start reading the notes okay so the three unpaid cartilages will be the largest laryngeal cartilage that is your thyroid and then your cricoid and then your epiglottis okay most important right thyroid cricoid and epiglottis and the three paired will be most importantly arytenoids that gives attachment to your vocal cords and the small corniculate over the arytenoid and the cuneiform so these are the three paired and the three unpaired cartilages no need to buy heart so once you understand the structure of the larynx it will be easy for you see uh, if you can see here in this picture from the anterior view so in this anterior view you can see this is the thyroid cartilage okay so this entire thing is a thy thyroid cartilage which have ala on both sides okay or wings on both sides just like a notebook in imagine someone sitting of your friend in front of your friend one of your friends sitting in your friend and they are reading in their own book so how it will be two wings will be the two sides of the book the two wings will be there and in between you can see a notch over the thyroid cartilage this notch is anteriorly protruded you can see over here so that we call it as adam's apple okay this is more prominent in males okay in males this will be more prominent it forms an angle of 90 degrees in males whereas in females it will be flat it forms an angle of 120 degrees in females so that's why in males you can notice a 
prominent Adam's apple over the thyroid cartilage, right? Above, if you see, this is a hyoid bone, okay? So, and this is the, coming to the larynx, the main bulk of the thyroid is formed, uh, larynx is formed by your thyroid cartilage, two ala, one Adam's apple, two sides superiorly, superior cornea will be there. If you see from the side, this is the superior cornea. If you see from the posterior, these are the superior cornea, right? And also similarly, inferior cornea, those are attached to your cricoid cartilage no? that we will learn later on, okay? So this is the thyro cricothyroid joint, okay? See, this is the structure of the larynx. So first of all, you know about the thyroid and now come to the cricoid. You can see the cricoid cartilage lying over here. This is, it is very thin anteriorly. Anteriorly, this cricoid cartilage is very thin. We call it as cricoid arch. If you see from the side, see how it is ascending. The size of the, the width of the cricoid cartilage will be ascending. If you go from anterior to posterior, okay, it will be like this. So anteriorly, your cricoid cartilage will be very thin. And if, if you are looking from the lateral side, anteriorly it will be thin. And once you go towards the posterior, it will be very height. The height of the cricoid cartilage will increase. Okay, so if you see from the lateral, this will be the structure of your uh, cricoid cartilage and this posterior part, you can see how lengthy, how uh, how much height is this cricoid uh, uh, cartilage is having on the posterior. This is called as cricoid lamina. So cricoid anteriorly, it is called as arch because it is very thin arch like, whereas posteriorly it is like a uh, paper like this lamina, it is called as lamina posteriorly okay cricoid lamina posteriorly and over the cricoid you can see two arytenoids sitting on either side okay and uh, you can see the cricoid ha arytenoid having a posterior lateral muscular process and anteriorly one this one uh, vocal process okay so if you take the structure of the arytenoid imagine a triangular cartilage sitting over the cricoid superior surface on the posterior cricoid lamina okay the posterior laterally it will be having a muscular process anteriorly it will be having a vocal process similarly the other side of the other side arytenoid will also be having a muscular process posterior laterally and anterior vocal process anteriorly from here the vocal cords will be attaching okay the vocal cords will be arising from the vocal process anteriorly located over the arytenoid cartilage the arytenoid cartilage itself sits over your cricoid lamina right okay so this and vocal cords are anteriorly attached to your anteriorly lying your thyro thyroid cartilage right you know see this is your thyroid cartilage right if you see from posterior see this is your thyroid cartilage right Okay, the posterior surface of your thyroid alley. Okay, see here your vocal cords are going here from here and they are attaching to the posterior surface of your thyroid, thyroid cartilage. In the lateral view, you can see it very clearly here. See the arytenoids. This is the cricoid. This is cricoid arch. This is, is it visible? The cricoid arch, cricoid lamina. Okay, above it are sitting the arytenoid cartilages. And the vocal cord arising from here, you can see the vocal cords attach to the posterior surface of the thyroid alley in the midline anteriorly. And uh, they are at posteriorly, they are attached to the vocal process of the arytenoid cartilage lying uh, above the cricoid lamina. And above the arytenoid, you can see two small cartilages lying over there. They are called corniculate, corniculate cartilage or uh, uh, cartilages of Santorini, you call it as another name for corniculate cartilages is called as cartilages of Santorini. Above the corniculate lies the cuneiform cartilages. So this cuneiform also called as cartilages of Risberg. So once again, just a quick revision. See, this is the thyroid cartilage. Hope everyone is able to see here. Okay, this is the anterior to alley of the thyroid cartilage. This is the notch that is the Adam's apple, which is very prominent anteriorly. 
it forms 90 degree in males 120 degrees in females so that's why 90 degrees it comes projecting towards anterior part of the neck and uh, it projects outward prominently in males whereas in females it is less prominent and uh, structures of the thyroid cartilage these are the superior cornway of the thyroid cartilage these are the inferior cornway of the thyroid cartilage inferior cornway of the thyroid cartilage attached to the cricoid cartilage forming a cricothyroid joint this is cricoid cartilage this is thyroid cartilage so the joint between them two is cricothyroid joint okay this is the cricothyroid joint and uh, coming to the arytenoids which lie over the cricoid okay above the cricoid the cricoid will be having uh, i have already told you anteriorly the cricoid is very thin that is called as arch posteriorly it will be very uh, height wise it is very large this is called as lamina on the lamina if you see here see the how the cricoid cartilage is increasing its height as we go posteriorly so on the cricoid lamina posteriorly superior surface of it lie both the arytenoid triangularly or pyramidal shaped arytenoid cartilages it has a vocal process anteriorly that gives rise to vocal cord and vocal cords attaches anteriorly to the posterior surface of the thyroid alley midline of the thyroid alley right clear i think till now it is clear okay above the uh, this one arytenoids lie the corniculate or uh, santorini cartilages and above it lie the cuneiform or risber cartilages right so he, here you can see from the hyoid bone towards the thyroid cartilage anteriorly there is a membrane so this membrane is called as simple thyrohyoid membrane okay this is thyrohyoid membrane why it is thyrohyoid membrane the membrane that lies between thyroid cartilage and hyoid bone you can see the hyoid lying above here okay, you can see the thyroid cartilage here the superior surface the membrane that is connecting these both is called as thyrohyoid membrane okay so if you see from the posterior from the uh, posterior surface of your thyroid with the help of thyroepiglottic ligament okay so there arises a leafy cartilaginous structure that leafy cartilaginous structure is called as epiglottis epiglottis is attached to the thyroid posterior surface okay at the midline at the midpoint just below the adam's apple okay with the help of a ligament called thyroepiglottic ligament okay the another name for this ligament is broil's ligament okay thyroepiglottic ligament with the help of that ligament cartilage arises the epiglottis arises and it arises above the level of the hyoid right from the anterior if you see see how the uh, this your arytin uh, sorry this your uh, epiglottis is arising above the level of the hyoid from the posterior you can see the uh, epiglottis arising above the level of the hyoid okay if you see laterally see how your epiglottis is and uh, this is the mid sagittal section you can see how your epiglottis is arising from the this is the thyroid midline and uh, see this is the adam's apple notch just below it in the midline with the help of a thyroepiglottic ligament your epiglottis is arising from the thyroid cartilage right and it is arising above the level of your hyoid bone and here there is a ligament in between this epiglottis and hyoid bone this ligament is called as again hyoepiglottic ligament hyoepiglottic ligament okay now these three structures enclose a space here this space is called as preepiglottic space okay okay preepiglottic space or boyer's space okay preepiglottic space is formed by is the boundaries of the preepiglottic space now you can very simply you yourself can say see the superiorly there is hyoepiglottic ligament because that ligament is connecting both hyoid bone and epiglottis so this is hyoepiglottic ligament superiorly posteriorly you can see the epiglottis anteriorly you can see the thyrohyoid membrane so simple so no need to by heart the boundaries of any anatomical structure 
first you try to draw a diagram rough diagram okay if you see here you will be having your hyoid and here you will be having your thyroid right okay below you will be having your cricoid okay on the cricoid lamina lie your arytenoid cartilages over that corniculate over that cuneiform and from here arises your epiglottis right okay so here here in between the hyoid and in between the thyroid you have thyrohyoid membrane here in between the epiglottis and in between the hyoid you have hyoepiglottis ligament now this triangular space is that which is called as pre epiglottic space the space let that lies anterior to the epiglottis that's why pre epiglottic space that is covered by the boundaries superiorly you can see hyoepiglottic ligament anteriorly thyrohyoid ligament and uh, uh, posteriorly epiglottis so these are the boundaries forming your uh, pre epiglottic space or boyer space and you can see a vocal process lying anteriorly on the arytenoid cartilage from there the vocal cords will come and attach here your epiglottis will attach to the thyroid cartilage posterior surface with the help of a ligament here that ligament is called as thyroepiglottic ligament or another name is broyles ligament right so till now till this level i think it is clear the anatomy is clear i think right okay so with this we will move on to the next <coughs> so will this will move on to the next uh, uh, part okay and one more point i need to mention here see on either sides you can see there are two openings on the thyrohyoid membrane so through these openings three structures will pass on either side superior laryngeal van sl van so on either sides of the thyrohyoid membrane there is an opening through which superior laryngeal vein superior laryngeal artery superior laryngeal nerve so this sl van will pass on either side through the openings in the thyrohyoid membrane remember that okay and now coming to the next part okay i think till now it is clear okay so coming to the various structures uh, till now we have discussed so all this is about anatomy of your uh, larynx is that clear anatomy is clear any doubts so is it clear okay fine I hope so it is clear right so there are no replies fine no problem so we will move on to the next part that is your so your anatomy is completed now uh, quickly we will move on to the uh, we were discussing about the two structures two small cartilages over here uh, yeah that is your corniculate and cuneiform the corniculate and cuneiform so you know so function of this cartilages is not yet known the other name for this is cartilage of santorini this same word you will come across somewhere else that is fissures of santorini so where do you come across this fissures of santorini in the external auditory canal okay so this is as we discussed in the last class if anyone remember so this is your external auditory canal this is your tympanic membrane this is your middle ear so down lies your anterior inferior lies your parotid okay parotid gland right so there will be some openings over here in the uh, post in the external acoustic canal inferior wall these openings are called as fissures of santorini okay and also another openings are also present they are also called as foramen of hashki if you remember okay so infections can spread if an otitis externa patient that is the infection of the external auditory canal the infections can spread to and fro this same patient can have a, a presentation of parotitis also 
or the aparotitis patient can even complain of pain in the external auditory canal because the infections can spread to and fro through these fissures of Santorini or foramen of Hushkey. Another cartilage here you can see is the cuneiform, okay, cuneiform cartilage. Here you can see small cartilage structures, cuneiform. The other name for this cuneiform cartilage is your cartilage of Risberg, okay. Where else you get this name cartilage of Risberg? Anyone remember? Nerve of Risberg. What is this nerve of Risberg? What is nervous intermedius? Anyone? Okay, fine. So, what is nervous intermedius? It is the sensory branch of facial nerve. We all know facial nerve is a motor nerve, but it has also got a sensory branch that is called as nervous intermedius. The significance of this nerve is this nervous intermedius in case of acoustic neuroma where your squamous cells of the vestibular nerve will arise and form a bulk okay will form a tumor okay the tumor arises from the squamous cells of the vestibular nerve vestibular squamoma also another name vestibular squamoma the this tumor will compress the beside lying this in nervous intermedius so what happens the sensory branch of the facial nerve this is compressed so when this nerve is compressed due to the tumor uh, that is vestibular squamoma the sensory the area that is being supplied with this nerve will become hypoesthetic so decreased sensation over this over the area where this branch is supplied so where do this branch supply if you take the external auditory canal, right, if you take the external auditory canal, okay, the posterior wall of the external auditory canal, or if you take, uh, okay, this is anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, the posterior wall of the external auditory canal is supplied by this sensory branch of the facial nerve, okay. Okay, the, along with your Arnold's nerve or Alderman's nerve, the branch, vagus branch that is. Okay, so here in cases of acoustic neuroma, the patient will have a decreased sensation of the posterior meatal wall, hypoesthesia of posterior meatal wall. We call this sign as Hitzelberger sign. Okay, so Hitzelberger sign is positive in cases of acoustic neuroma. So this was described in the last class. If anyone have forgot, can recollect it here. Okay. So that is Risberg. So that is the Risberg, right? So uh, corniculate, Santorini, fissures of Santorini also, right? Done. And we'll quickly move on to the epiglottis over your uh, pre-epiglottic space or Boyer space is over and coming to the joints. Okay. So we will quickly discuss about the joints. Yeah. So these are the joints uh, present in your larynx. One joint is mainly still now we have studied that is cricothyroid joint. The name itself speaks it lies between cricoid cartilage and thyroid cartilage. Where exactly the inferior cornu of the thyroid cartilage is attached at the posterior lateral surface of the cricoid cartilage. Okay. So this here the movement the, with the help of uh, you see, if your cricoid is lying like this and the thyroid is attached like this, your thyroid will move like this, okay? Your thyroid, with the help of this joint, uh, your thyroid will move like this, okay? So that is what is being shown here. With the help of this joint, uh, the movement, the thyroid cartilage can move with the help of this joint, the cricothyroid joint, okay? That is about your cricothyroid. Another joint is your the, the cricoarytenoid joint as you all know when you see from the lateral side the cricoid will be appearing like this this is arch this is lamina and uh, here you have a cricoarytenoid joint and on the superior surface of the lamina you, you know there is a arytenoid cartilage sitting so there will be between cricoid and arytenoid cricoarytenoid joint will be there so with the help of this joint uh, 
the arytenoid can glide a bit to forward as well as rotate on either side okay swing on either side okay so these are the two types of movements swinging and gliding the arytenoid can glide forward backward over the uh, superior surface of the cricoid and it can sw swing either way uh, on the uh, making the cricoid lamina as the base can you understand this see this is your cricoid lamina cricoid arch if you see from the lateral it will be like this so above your arytenoid will be sitting like this right it can glide a bit forward okay it can glide a bit forward and it can go back right and if you see it can swing from slide from side to side also and this side like this okay it can swing like this swinging movement as well as gliding movement so these two kinds of movements that is rotatory movement or swinging movements or rotatory movements and gliding movements these two movements will occur at the crico arytenoid joint okay remember rotatory and gliding type of movements occur at the crico arytenoid joint why i am saying this much detail is later on you will understand all the vocal cord positions very easily if you understand this muscles this arrangement of the anatomy in the larynx and its muscular attachments also just we are coming uh, towards it okay so if you take uh, the lateral view of your uh, this one uh, thyroid uh, the la larynx arrangement of the cartilages you know so this is your thyroid right okay from it arises your epiglottis like this above right cricoid will be lying down this okay above here here will be arytenoid will be arranged like this corniculate cuneiform right so from here your vocal cords this is the vocal process anteriorly the vocal cords will get attached over here right so if you take this level okay if you take this level like this right these three cartilages epiglottis corniculate and cuneiform okay these three are made up of elastic cartilage so no need to by heart again here if you remember the arrangement the superior lying three cartilages cuneiform corniculate and epiglottis are made up of elastic cartilage and the lower lying cricoid sorry cricoid thyroid and arytenoid okay cricoid thyroid and arytenoid these three are made up of hyaline cartilage so remember this okay so three cartilages lying superiorly are made up of elastic cartilage and the three cartilages lying below are made up of hyaline cartilage okay this if you uh, remember the anatomy it will be easy for you to remember which is elastic and which is hyaline you can come in the alphabetical order e comes first so elastic above and hyaline below like that also you can remember right and coming to the okay so coming to the next uh, hyaline cartilages this thing is over and uh, another name another important structure here we need to discuss is your uh, ari epiglottic fold this is very important what is this ari epiglottic fold exactly or this is also called as quadrangular membrane okay this is also called as quadrangular membrane see here there was epiglottis over here right okay this is your thyroid cartilage cricoid cartilage okay if you remove these muscles you can see your uh, here arytenoid also you can see over here the corniculate cuneiform can be seen over here right okay see the quadrangular membrane that covers it starts covering uh, anteriorly it covers the epiglottis right and posteriorly it covers the arytenoid corniculate and cuneiform complex okay so so from the anterior towards the posterior it covers from top to bottom okay so till here like this it will be so this is your the borders you can see here your epiglottis was there anteriorly and posteriorly corniculate cuneiform down here arytenoids this is your cricoid right see you can see our cricoid over here okay so this is your uh, quadrangular membrane or ari epiglottic fold ari means arytenoid 
epi means epiglottic okay as it is covering posteriorly arytenoids to anteriorly epiglottis it is called as ary epiglottic fold as it is quadrangular in shape it is also called as quadrangular membrane see he, this is the this borders of the ary epiglottic fold are forming the superior margin of your larynx this is the inlet of the larynx okay your inlet of larynx is formed by your ary epiglottic fold or quadrangular membrane if you see an endoscopic picture over here okay if you see an endoscopic picture see the ary epiglottic fold which is covering uh, all along the anterior it is covering the epiglottis and sideways towards the posterior it is covering the arytenoids okay it's covering all the internal laryngeal framework the cartilages and all musculatures are covered by this mucosal layer that is your ary epiglottic fold or quadrangular membrane and it still it extends down till here okay and see the margins of the lower border of your ary epiglottic fold you can see these are the margins the thickened margins of your lower uh, border of the ary epiglottic fold the lower border of the ary epiglottic fold these are these are thickened to form a false vocal cords what is your false vocal cord okay what do you mean by false vocal cord it is the thickened lower border of ary epiglottic fold right so these are the false vocal cords so you, you can see the structures lying below these are the true vocal cords still down below to this false vocal cords you can see true vocal cords lying below false vocal cords will be lying above in between these two there will be a sac lying laterally okay beyond the ary epiglottic fold you can see this is the ary epiglottic fold the mucosal fold behind this laterally there is a space that space we call it as a saccule of larynx okay or we also call it as a vestibule of larynx okay i think you are getting the point what is false vocal cord and what is true vocal cord if you can see this picture see this entire thing is your ary epiglottic fold okay and see here the lower border is thickened to form this false vocal cords and these are the true vocal cords okay this is a sagittal view okay so if you see there is a space in between this false vocal cord and true vocal cords this space is called as saccule of larynx or vestibule of the larynx the importance of the saccule or vestibule is they see saccule is also called as oil can of larynx why it is called as oil can of larynx means see whenever you are speaking or you are talking continue you are talking both your vocal folds will vibrate or both your vocal cords will be vibrating and touching each other the frequency of these vibrations will be approximately 200 times per second so you can't even see with your naked eye that much amount of vibrations will be there in between these two vocal cords so if they are vibrating with such a high frequency definitely they are prone to get damaged due to the friction between them huge amounts of friction heat can be generated and the structures will get damaged within no time so to avoid this to keep them lubricated and to reduce the friction between these two vocal cords you can see the saccule the oil can of the larynx they will be secreting this is rich in mucus and secretory glands all the secretions will be coming on to the surface of the vocal cords and they will be keeping the vocal cords uh, wet and uh, lubricated and uh, ultimately they will be keeping them healthy okay so that so that is the importance of your saccule okay and this lower border of the uh, ary epiglottic fold that is false vocal cord uh, instead of true vocal folds if false vocal folds approximated towards each other instead of the true vocal cords approximating each other during phonation or during voice production if the upper false vocal cords are approximating instead of the true vocal cords in some cases it will happen that condition is called as dysphonia plica 
ventricularis. Hope you are getting my point. What is dysphonia plica ventricularis means voice produced by false vocal cords. Right? Okay. So that is condition is called as dysphonia plica ventricularis. A simple speech therapy will help the patients again come back to normal. The treatment is only speech therapy. Okay. So this endoscopic picture will clearly tell you. So this is the epiglottis actually. Okay. These are the, the arytenoid bulge you can see below lying or corniculate and queen form over here. Right. You can see entire muscles and uh, cartilage are covered by this membrane. That membrane is called as aryepiglottic fold or quadrangular membrane. The lower border of this thickened membrane is nothing but your false vocal cord. Approximation of these false vocal cords producing voice during phonation. This condition is called as dysphonia plica ventricularis. In between the false vocal cords and the true vocal cords, there is a gap through which we can enter into a space that lies behind this quadrangular membrane. So that space is called as saccule of the larynx. In sagittal section, you can clearly see it, the saccule of the larynx. The secretions from here will be wetting the vocal cord surface, lubricating it such that it reduces the friction and the heat generation during voice production. And uh, that uh, <coughs> that is the function of the saccular ven uh, ventricle of the larynx or vestibule of the larynx. Where else you get this word vestibule? What is vestibule in case of ear? Anyone? In inner ear, bony labyrinth. In inner ear, bony labyrinth, you have a structure called vestibule, which lodges the two structures, saccule and utricle of membranous labyrinth, if you remember. Okay, saccule and utricle of membranous labyrinth are lodged by the vestibule of bony labyrinth inside, right? In nose, where do you get this vestibule? In the anterior part of the nose, the hair lined structure in the anterior part of the nose is vestibule, where your emissary veins, there are few veins, uh, these veins are directly connected to the cavernous sinus. So, any infections, vestibulitis is, is uh, dangerous in few cases where the infection can directly spread towards the cavernous sinus and can cause cavernous sinus thrombosis, right? So, that we will come mm, to discuss in the nose part. Hope everyone is following here, right? And uh, next, coming to the next part. Okay, so as we are discussing about the saccule, okay? I would like to discuss here a condition of the saccule that is called as, what is that condition? Laryngocele, condition of the saccule. You might have heard about this laryngocele, okay? What exactly is laryngocele is that? See, here you have your saccule. If your saccule dilates like this, okay, if your saccule dilates, still if more pressure is there, it dilates, huh? dilates like this and it also pushes this aryepiglottic fold medially, okay. So, this will be pushed medially. As this is a cartilage heart structure, this won't get pushed. But outside some people you will be seeing a swelling, especially in trumpet blowers, okay. Those who are blowing the trumpet, uh, Continuously, those people you can see a swelling coming over here. On pressing, it will be because just air is filled in this laryngocele. If you compress it, you will hear a gurgling sound. Okay, that sign is called as Bryce sign. Okay, okay, so that sign, what is that sign? Bryce sign. Okay, <coughs> so in laryngocele, you see a sign called as Bryce sign. Okay, see how it is coming towards outward. Okay, see this is the laryngocele forming in the saccule of the larynx. So, this is the true vocal cord. Okay, false vocal cord is the epiglottic fold is lifted up and pushed inside. See how this is uh, being uh, dilated and the saccule, the dilatation is coming outward and lying on the external surface, right? So, if you press this as there is only air, that air will leak again into inside the larynx. So, this leaking air will be heard as a gurgling sound. Uh, so, that sign we call it as Bryce sign. Okay. So, Bryce sign. Okay. What is this Bryce sign? 
<coughs> on compression of the external neck swelling, you are hearing a gurgling sound. In that condition, this bright sign is seen in a condition called as laryngocele, which is very common in trumpet blowers or glass blowers. Okay, right. Endoscopically, if you see, there is a dilatation over here. If you see, see the larynx, you can see this is the false vocal cord. This is the true vocal fold margin. In between these two, if you go beyond, behind, uh, or uh, laterally and upward, so here is the saccule. So that saccule will be dilated due to the uh, uh, excessive air entry, and this will be pushed medially. So you can see a bulge here medially. On CT scan also, you can see how the saccule is dilated outward and inward. The dumbbell shape, it's a, a cystic air containing fluid, you can see, air containing sac, you can see over here. So this is laryngocele, okay. So, but you can see bright sign is seen in laryngocele. Don't get confused with another sign called as Boyce sign. What is Boyce sign? In case of Zenker's diverticulum, okay. In case of Zenker's diverticulum, you hear a oh, you hear a gurgling sound when you press the swelling in the neck. Usually, it will be a little bit lateral and it will be a little bit below. Okay, so that Zenker's diverticulum is abnormal. You saw uh, the uh, musculature abnormal dilatation of the muscles. Okay, so the uh, dilatation of the muscles they form a sac posteriorly. Store uh, they storing the food contents inside. So foul smelling order will be there to these patients. That is, we call it a Zenker's diverticulum. Boise sign is seen over here, but Bryce sign is seen in laryngocele. If there is any confusion, RY, RY, like that you can remember. Okay, larynx, laryngocele, Bryce sign, okay. A voice, esophagus, okay, food related, that is, okay, voice sign. Likewise also you can remember, okay, clear. And uh, coming to the next uh, structure, okay, I hope this is clear. And uh, coming to the next structure, that is, yeah. So next below line here, you can see a membranous structure between the thyroid lower surface and the cricoid upper surface. So this membrane is called, again, you can see cricothyroid membrane, okay. So it is between the cricoid and thyroid, cricothyroid membrane. In cases of emergency uh, airway obstructions, if you are unable to intubate the patient, intubation is failed, but the patient saturation is falling, somehow you have to provide air entry and tracheostomy will take some more time. No specialist available to do a tracheostomy there. You have to identify the cricothyroid membrane just first palpate from top to bottom. You first identify the Adam's apple, the prominent notch over the thyroid cartilage. Then go below. You will touch another cartilage down. So you will, you can feel a gap from the above that cartilage. That gap is nothing but your cricothyroid membrane. And uh, through that uh, membrane, puncture the, uh, the cricothyroid membrane exactly in the midline. And you will land in the airway without any complications. That process is called as cricothyroidotomy. Cricothyroidotomy. Okay. So, this is one of the emergency airway providing procedure where the, it is very difficult to intubate and uh, the, you are unable to get a tracheostomy done. The other life saving procedure only you have in your hands at that time is cricothyroidotomy. Right. Okay. So, this is cricothyroidotomy is done through this cricothyroid membrane right clear and coming to the muscles of the larynx so next we will come to the so till now all the cartilages all the ligaments all the membranes we have studied okay and their related conditions now we will come to the muscles of larynx okay so there are intrinsic muscles of the larynx and extrinsic muscles of the larynx Okay, what do you mean by intrinsic muscles of the larynx? Muscles that connect the structures of larynx itself. Okay, so the muscles that are connected, muscle means it connects, it has an origin, it has an insertion. So the origin and insertion will be in between the structures that are related to larynx only. Those are intrinsic muscles of the larynx. 
whereas extrinsic muscles the origin or insertion one will be from the laryngeal structure and the other one will be the other external structure other than the larynx so these are external la muscles of the larynx that connect larynx to other structures okay so these can connect laryngeal structure to laryngeal structure right hope it is clear the differentiation between intrinsic muscles of the larynx and extrinsic muscles of the larynx right again if you come across intrinsic muscles of the larynx there are two uh, two divisions those that act on the vocal cord those that act on the laryngeal inlet okay so your vocal cord has got three different types of movements abductor abduction laterally movement adduction okay coming inward inward movement adduction abduction lateral movement and tensor getting constricted okay that is your tensor okay tensor movements right okay so what exactly is the abductor muscle is your posterior cricoarytenoid is the only abductor of vocal cords remember this point very most important mcq the only abductor of vocal cord is posterior cricoarytenoid what exactly is this saying posterior cricoarytenoid see if you go back to your uh, this one uh, cricoarytenoid joint okay how this is named if you understand how this is named you will come to know what exactly is this posterior cricoarytenoid see here you can see if you are seeing from above see this is the the this is the thyroid cartilage right see the adam's apple see the alley of the thyroid and see the superior cornu and the inferior cornu inferiorly attaching to the cricoid cartilage you can see the cricoid cartilage okay and uh, you can see the arytenoids lying over the cricoid lamina posteriorly so these are the arytenoid the vocal process of the arytenoid vocal cords attached to arising from the vocal process and attaching to the posterior surface of the thyroid cartilage on either sides see laryngeal inlet is opened when the both the vocal cords gets abducted okay so when both the vocal cords gets abducted the airway will get opened right very important posterior cricoarytenoid is the only abductor doing this opening movement where exactly is this posterior cricoarytenoid located it is the name itself speaks posterior so it is lying posteriorly crico and arytenoid it is connecting both cricoid and arytenoid you can see there is a muscular process here on the posterior on the posterior part of your arytenoid cartilage okay this is your muscular process from this muscular process arises your posterior cricoarytenoid muscle you can see this posterior cricoarytenoid is arising and it is going down and it is attaching to your posterior surface of the cricoid lamina so what happens this see this is the muscular process right so when this muscular process the posterior cricoarytenoid will arise and attach to the cricoid lamina and here also from this muscular process posterior cricoarytenoid will arise and attach to the muscular uh, cricoid lamina so what happens when this muscular processes are contracted by the posterior what happens see the anterior vocal processes see the posterior uh, muscular process see can you see what is happening exactly when this posterior muscular processes are being pulled towards each other the anterior vocal processes are coming lateral we already learned that arytenoid will rotate on the surface of the cricoid so this is the rotatory movement as well as it also glides a bit posteriorly so due to the pull of this posterior cricoarytenoid muscle so this is the movement that happens okay so what happens vocal processes which are lying like this due to the abductor pull by the only abductor muscle posterior cricoarytenoid this will move like this so what is happening vocal processes are getting lateralized so then your laryngeal inlet is getting widened opened okay that airway is opened so the muscle that helps in the opening of airway this is an indirect mcq muscle that helps in the opening of the airway that is your posterior cricoarytenoid see you can see when this muscle contracts 
the muscular process is pulled this side right medially so that the entire arytenoid structure will rotate like this they will rotate like this so what happens your vocal process is moving laterally both the vocal process are moving laterally so the vocal fold attached here is also moving laterally so when both the vocal folds move laterally you can get adequate airway right your laryngeal uh, inlet is opening here hope you have understood how your posterior require arytenoid functions okay so very important bit that's why i have took this much time to explain you that is posterior cricoarytenoid is very important you can see here this is the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle okay so you can see this entire muscle attaching over the posterior surface of the cricoid laminae and attaching to the muscular process so when this muscle contracts it will pull the muscular process nearby so that anteriorly lying vocal process will get lateralized okay so you can in while we are studying use it to remember like this okay so this is the this is the vocal process and uh, so this is the arytenoid cartilage and this is the muscular process of both the the middle fingers both the middle fingers are the muscular processes so when the muscular processes are being pulled uh, you can see the vocal processes are also getting lateralized another muscle is there that is called as lateral cricoarytenoid that will pull like this that will pull the muscular process like this so then what happens both the vocal cords will come nearby that will close the airway that is adduction movement that is called as lateral cricoarytenoid so that lateral cricoarytenoid is the adductor of the just a minute lateral cricoarytenoid is the adductor of the vocal cord so this is one of the important adductor of the vocal cord and in between the two arytenoids if you can see here see this is your lateral cricoarytenoid muscle see again this lateral cricoarytenoid again it is lying laterally okay lateral cricoarytenoid it is lying laterally and it is attaching to cricoid and arytenoid okay so that's why this muscle is named as lateral cricoarytenoid muscle this muscle lies laterally and it attaches to the muscular process of your arytenoid and the, the cricoid so the cricoid lateral surface right so when this muscle contracts what happens your muscular process is pulled laterally so the same way again what happens the vocal processes are pulled medially so what happens now there is no airway the both the vocal folds have come nearer and there is no airway that's vocal cords are getting medialized so medialization that is adduction inward movement of the vocal folds is done by your lateral cricoarytenoid muscle whereas lateralization of the vocal cords or uh, pull, pulling of them or uh, abduction or lateral movement of the vocal cords is being done by your posterior cricoarytenoid muscle just you have to remember the uh, anatomical structures and their arrangement so that easily you can understand the processes happening there right hope you are getting my point if any doubts please let me know i will repeat no problem so daily even we can extend the class or we can again take another class tomorrow also if not time is not sufficient but try to understand the concept here itself and tomorrow you just read whatever today we have taught in the class it will be clear for you with the same notes you will be uh, coming with a clarity if you have the basics right you can uh, answer any tough mcq so mcqs will become tough only when they target the basics if you get the basics right you can answer the tough questions easy questions everyone will answer so all students will lie in that level whoever will be able to answer that bit of tough questions so because basic questions will be carrying a heavy weightage okay so remember that and uh, so another muscles right after lateral uh, cricoarytenoid in case of adductor adductors okay along with lateral cricoarytenoid another muscle is there that is called as interarytenoid as well as another thyroarytenoid muscle also is known to help what is this interarytenoid exactly if you see here interarytenoid these two are the arytenoids right arytenoid cartilages this the muscle that connects the medial surfaces of both arytenoids 
is called as interarotenoids, which lies in between both the arotenoids. So, a pull of these muscles, what happens when it contracts, the pull of these muscles will pull the both the arotenoids nearer. So, what happens? There will be the vocal process, inward movement will be there a little bit. Major bulk of the inward movement or reduction is done by your lateral cricoarotenoid only. Okay, along with that, interarotenoid is also known to cause the adductor movement. And also the tensor, what is your tensor? Tens uh, means tensor means tightening of the vocal cord. Okay, that with that muscle which tightens the or pulls the vocal cords uh, anterior posteriorly. Okay, like this. Okay, imagine a tug of war where you are pulling the uh, rope. Okay, so that means you are tensing that rope. Okay, so that is called as tensor muscles. Those movement is done by these tensor muscles. This tensor movement is done by cricothyroid and vocalis muscle. Okay. So, what exactly is this cricothyroid muscle again? Okay. See, you can see here. See, cricothyroid. This is cricoid, right? When you are seeing from the superior, this is cricoid and this is thyroid. Okay. Right. Okay. So, here you have your vocal cords, right? Here you have your vocal cords. Already we have studied uh, about the cricoarotenoid, sorry, uh, the cricothyroid joint, right? The inferior cornu of the thyroid, okay? There the superior cornu will be there, okay? Right? If you remember from the side, if you see, it will be like this. So this joint formed by the inferior cornu of the thyroid and the posterior lateral surface of the cricoid here, over this joint, your thyroid can move a anterior posterior movement like this with the help of this joint. Okay. Your thyroid can swing like, can move like this, like a hinge with the help of this cricothyroid joint. Okay. So, to do this movement, some muscle has to pull the thyroid like this, right? So, exactly from the thyroid internal surface okay to the cricoid external surface here like this okay here like this there will be muscular fibers will be there so when this muscle contracts when this muscle contracts what happens your thyroid cartilage will get pulled like this antero inferiorly so that you know here you have your arotenoid this is the vocal process and this vocal cord is attaching over here what happens if your arotenoid is staying here only and only your thyroid with the help of this hinge joint, your thyroid is coming forward, is moving forward. What happens to this vocal cord? This vocal cord is tensed because from the arotenoid process, your arotenoid vocal process, your vocal cord is coming and this vocal cord is attaching to the thyroid. So once this surface moves forward, this entire structure, the thyroid entire structure, moves forward what happens an arotenoid is staying here only with the help of cricoarotenoid joint what happens to this vocal cord it will get tensed right it will get pulled lengthened so that is what is called as tensor tensioning movement of the vocal cord the tensor movement is done by your cricothyroid muscle Th these are the cricothyroid muscles you can see on either side attaching the thyroid and cricoid right so cricothyroid muscle and also you can see thyroarotenoid along parallel to the vocal cord you can see two muscles okay passing here this is vocalis muscle and this is thyroarotenoid muscle so these two muscles will also help in tensor movement as well as when these muscles contract also you can see the vocal cords getting tense and uh, your vocalis as well as thyroarotenoid are also known to cause tensor movements right okay Okay, so cricothyroid and vocalis are known as tensors of the vocal cord. And now the muscles that act on the laryngeal inlet. Okay, so that which opens the inlet and that which closes the inlet. Okay, so that which opens the inlet is the thyroepiglottis. We have already discussed how your thyroepiglottis muscle uh, lies. If you go back, okay, if you go back. So, here bit between the thyroid, this is the thyroid and epiglottis, okay. So, in between these two, there will be a thyroepiglottis muscle. So, that will be opening, we will come to see here. 
okay thyro epiglottis muscle will be there see this muscle is coming like this okay so this on contraction will close these are interarytenoids see from this uh, interarytenoids from here from this arytenoid to this arytenoid it will go the fibers will go and come like this once these fibers contract there will be the inlet will come closer so the closure of the inlet is interarytenoid and also the opener is thyroarytenoid right so the opener is thyroarytenoid muscle so remember this okay so that which closes is interarytenoid remember okay so there are two interarytenoid fibers again don't get confused with this interarytenoid and this interarytenoid if you see one side arytenoid is there okay two sides both arytenoids these are transverse fibers of the interarytenoid this will cause adduction and oblique fibers oblique fibers will be there okay like this oblique fibers okay oblique fibers will be there if these contract the inlet will get closed okay these are the oblique fibers will cause closure of the laryngeal inlet again don't get confused between this interarytenoid and this interarytenoid interarytenoid transverse fibers will cause adduction interarytenoid transverse fibers will cause will pull the both the arytenoids together adduction interarytenoid oblique fibers will cause the closure of the inlet of the larynx so, so interarytenoid oblique will cause it is the closure of the laryngeal inlet okay hope this is clear don't get confused of course this is not much important to remember at your level most important <coughs> i'm sorry so at your level most important is posterior cricoarytenoid lateral cricoarytenoid and cricothyroid which is a tensor of the vocal cord okay. see i am continuously speaking so my vocal folds are under constant friction okay and your saccule alone oil can of the larynx alone is insufficient to lubricate this much continuous vocal phonation so what happens the drying up of the vocal cords when they are touching each other due to the drying up there will be a friction heat generated and a slight inflammation of the vocal cords will cause your cough okay Okay. so just you have to wait with your with water okay hope this all are clear so just now we were discussing about the cricothyroid joint how it tenses okay so once the cricothyroid pulls the thyroid it will become like this we are, earlier it is lying like this okay once the cricothyroid pulls the thyroid will come anterior and uh, you can see the vocal cord getting taut or getting tightened so that is it getting tensed okay and now coming to the the structures pre epiglottic space is filled with a fat remember that normally pre epiglottic space is filled with flat uh, with a fat so this is the epiglottis okay epiglottis you can see hyo epiglottic ligament thyrohyoid ligament right so this is filled with fat normally S cancers sorry cancers or malignancies of base of tongue and uh, supraglottis they invade into this pre epiglottic space or boyer space okay so hope okay so we will come to the next point so posted all the muscle actions hope you have understood okay i am moving on to the next part of our discussion okay all these are over thyroepiglottis interarytenoid all these are over okay now we'll come to a condition called as spasmodic dysphonia okay spasmodic any doubts till now any doubts opener explain again so someone is asking about <coughs> so 
So opener, laryngeal inlet opener, someone is asking about the opener of the larynx. Okay, so the opener of the larynx exactly is found by thyroepiglottis muscle. If you see this, if you have to see the lateral view, okay, you can see this is the thyroid and this is the epiglottis. You have some fibers over here. So these are the thyroepiglottis in between thyroid and in the epiglottis. So both the sides on this side, these fibers on the other side also these fibers will be there. So when these fibers contract, what happens? This layer will be pulled laterally, isn't it? And on that side also those fibers, they pull, that will be pulled that side. So if this layer is pulled to this side and that layer is pulled that side, what happens? Obviously, the space between these two will increase. The opening between these two will increase. So that's how your thyroepiglottis will act as an opener of the laryngeal inlet. Okay. Hope this is clear. Okay, so now we will quickly move on to the another condition that is spasmodic dysphonia, right? So coming to the spasmodic dysphonia, okay. Okay, so coming to spasmodic dysphonia, okay. short form SD. Okay, so <clears throat> what is exactly spas dysphonia? What is exactly dysphonia? Phonia means phonation, voice, and dysphonia means painful phonation, means pain while speaking, that is dysphonia. And this is happening due to spasm of the muscles of the larynx. So that's why it is called as spasmodic dysphonia, right? So painful phonation, okay, due to spasm of the intrinsic muscles of larynx, okay. Painful phonation due to spasm of intrinsic muscles of the larynx, right. So in this, we have type 1 that is abductor spasmodic dysphonia. So as that you know, what is the only abductor of the vocal cords? Posterior cricoarotenoid is the only abductor. So what happens if this gets spasm? Okay, if this gets tightly contracted, what, what is actually, actually this muscle is doing posterior cricoarotenoid? This is pulling the vocal cords laterally. And if the abductor muscle, that is the posterior cricoarotenoid is continuously contracted state, spasmic state, what happens? Your vocal cords will be lying in a completely lateralized state right so they won't come nearer okay so that's why both vocal cords will lie in a abducted position so now what happens normally your vocal folds will lie in intermediate or cadaveric position now they will lie in a more much more lateral position so they will be pulled still much laterally and they will be lying so whenever a patient tries this patient tries to speak uh, there is no adduction, there is no uh, vocal fold movement, right? As these are lateralized due to the pull by the lateral uh, posterior cricoarotenoid abduction, abducted state, uh, there is no pull acting inward. Whenever a patient tries to speak, uh, there is a leakage of the voice. The vocal cords won't come near to each other. The voice will get leaked uh, and uh, there will be a breathiness of the voice. Only the air will be leaking out as there is no inward movement of the vocal folds if there is inward movement of the vocal folds the air tries to tightly tries to escape through the both the adducted vocal folds then only the mucosal folds here on the medial surface will vibrate and those will produce your voice if these mucosal folds are not vibrating if the vocal cords are not getting adducted while speaking if they lie in a lateral position whenever you try to speak the air will straightforward leak above and leaky voice or breathy voice will be there okay so mainly in spasmodic dysphonia patient will be struggling to speak because whenever is uh, the muscle laryngeal muscles are under spasm and uh, they will be having a 
pain due to that spasm and the voice whenever they try to speak the voice will be breathy voice okay the treatment is again to give botox injection to relieve the spasm okay right hope you understood so if you had understand what exactly posterior thoracoid is doing you can easily understand what will be the position of the vocal cords in abductor spasmodic dysphonia and uh, what happens to the voice if the vocal cords are lying in that position you understood and for them to bring to normal you have to relieve the spasm of the abductor muscle that is posterior cricoarytenoid so a local botox injections into the posterior cricoarytenoid will relieve the spasm and again it will uh, normalize the vocal function right so this is about your spasmodic dysphonia type 1 abductor spasmodic dysphonia and now the next one is adductor spasmodic dysphonia just now you yourself can understand here the lateral trichoarytenoid is continuously in a spasmic uh, contracted position so now the usual vocal cords which should lie like this now they are pulled inward and they will lie very near to each other so now what happens <coughs> there is the patient will be struggling to breathe because the airway is very narrow now and patient will be having a strangled voice okay patient will be having a strangled voice okay again the treatment will be botox injection into the lca here botox injection will be given into the pca if the patient the saturation levels are unable to maintain unable to get maintained uh, in this condition then then we have to do a tracheostomy and if tracheostomy is not possible you have to go for a cricothyroid immediately and provide adequate airway first so first do life saving procedures and then go for the permanent uh, pos uh, manual uh, procedures right so this is all about your abductor and adductor spasmodic dysphonia hope this is clear and next we will go to another condition called as phonasthenia okay phonasthenia of larynx okay phonasthenia means weakness of asthenia weakness of phono voice muscles okay weakness of voice muscles in elderly you can see these changes okay press by laryngeus condition okay so the muscles will get weakened as you age as you know that is a natural process and due to the weakness there will be very uh, strained uh, it means a uh, very uh, sluggish voice will be there in this condition thyroarytenoid in between the thyroid and in between the arytenoid you know thyroarytenoid muscle is there alongside lying the vocal cords just lateral to the vocal cords there will be thyroarytenoid muscle will be lying you all know vocalis and thyroarytenoid will be lying over here so due to the weakness the muscles will come like this okay thyroarytenoid weakness okay and also in between the interarytenoids also this muscle will also become weaker so what happens the laryngeal inlet will become like this how this is looking this is looking like a keyhole right okay as you are inserting a key like this okay okay so this is looking like a keyhole so where do you see this keyhole glottis this is seen in phonasthenia keyhole glottis is seen in uh, uh, phonasthenia because of the weakness of the thyroarytenoid and interarytenoid muscles right okay both interarytenoid transverse fibers and thyroarytenoid will be weak here right so that is a condition called as phonasthenia and now coming to the next condition nerve supply of the larynx so we will quickly discuss again this is very important to understand the vocal cord palsy definitely an mcq will be there from vocal cord palsy okay so anything so most common mcq in unilateral vocal cord palsy the vocal cord will be lateralized and bilateral vocal cord palsy the both the vocal cords will be medialized what exactly is happening here why in case of unilateral vocal cord palsy one vocal cord is getting lateralized and in case of bilateral vocal cord palsy instead of both getting lateralized both are getting medialized here so what is the reason to understand this you need to know exactly the which muscle is being supplied by which nerve and in which paralysis what exactly is happening here okay 
so before going shall we take a break for five minutes short break
okay so uh, welcome back so let us start uh, at the class uh, we are at a narrow supply of uh, larynx so. so mainly the laryngeal narrow supply is supplied by vagus okay so mainly the laryngeal narrow supply is with vagus okay vagus nerve divides into two branches that is recurrent laryngeal nerve rln and superior nerve laryngeal nerve sln right okay so in larynx you have the muscles and mucosa so it has got motor supply as well as sensory supply supplying the mucosa okay to the mucosa the sensory supply should be there that mucosa means the lining inside the larynx right inside the larynx the layering uh, layer is the lining layer is the mucosa so to that the sensory supply should be there why sensory supply of the larynx is important when you are having food or eating if at all by chance if any food material enters into your larynx or into your supraglottic airway once they enter the airway your mucosa should be intact with narrow supply it should recognize the foreign body entry into the ear uh, into the sorry into the larynx airway and immediately it should initiate the cough reflex and that foreign body should be uh, ejected out from the airway choking just simply while while having food if you talk what happens the airway will open for you to talk okay so unless you open your airway you can't talk because see try uh, speaking while inhaling inside okay while inspiration you try to speak you can't so while inspiration you can't speak only while expiration if you want to talk you have to breathe out only okay only during expiration you can speak so the air expulsion expulsion through the vocal cords will vibrate this uh, medial margins of both the vocal folds vocal cords okay that mucosal vibrations uh, 200 uh, times per second they will vibrate and those vibrations will cause sound a, a tone a particular frequency tone each and every person will have a unique tone okay and uh, that uh, that uh, sound once it enters into the pharynx pharyngeal musculature oral cavity nasal cavity and that tone will be modulated into different kinds of sounds if i say na if i have to say na na means my tongue tip has to go and touch the palate okay if i have to say ka the middle part of my tongue has to touch the palate okay and if i have to say pa my both lips have to touch to each other ma oh, so for each and every otherwise for each and every word to be pronounced uh, you are uh, the uh, articulatory means the articulatory part of the phonation means your pharyngeal musculature oropharynx oral cavity nasopharynx all these muscles and your tongue and the lips all these things will be modulating accordingly and they will be producing different words different uh, alphabets or different uh, letters right okay so that is how you can you are able to communicate right otherwise if you just make a sound at your vocal cords in without moving your uh, lips or without your any uh, articulatory musculature right your pharynx or oral cavity or any muscles if you do not move and if just you want to try to speak you will just you can only produce one kind of tone uh, like that okay so you'll be able to produce only one kind of tone only you cannot produce all different kinds of letters or all different kinds of words okay so if you have to pro pro produce then the variations in the articulation this is what most important to modulate the producer tone from the vocal cords into different words okay so keep that in point and uh, so we'll quickly come to the uh, nerve supply of larynx okay the motor uh, supply to the larynx from sln sorry first we'll discuss the rln and sln so the rln will be supplying all intrinsic muscles of the larynx except cricothyroid right and rln will be supplying the mucosa above the level of vocal cord if you take the larynx and inside if this is the vocal cord level and inside this part will be supplied by recurrent laryngeal nerve and this part will be supplied by sense uh, uh, that superior laryngeal nerve 
okay so this is your so this side both sides both okay inside okay the mucosal lining the sensory lining okay and uh, if you come the coming to the motor uh, supply or the muscles musculature all muscles except cricothyroid is supplied by recurrent laryngeal nerve and sln supplies only cricothyroid and uh, also supplies sensory supply to below the level of vocal cord and uh, remember one thing sln here this cricothyroid is supplied by external branch of sln okay and here it is the below of level of vocal cord it is supplied by internal branch of sln remember this point just again need not by heart you can just simply see the mucosa is lying inside the larynx right so to supply inside the larynx internal branch can only supply right it's very simple external branch cannot supply the internal part right so external branch will supply the cricothyroid muscle i hope this is clear right and coming to the next okay see here your vagus nerve is coming and it is dividing into external uh, superior laryngeal nerve here green colored superior laryngeal nerve see the superior laryngeal nerve here okay it is dividing into two branches at the level of greater cornua of hyoid and this external branch is going down and supplying the cricothyroid muscle internal branch is entering through the through we have already discussed if anyone can remember okay okay this is your thyroid cartilage right okay here you have your hyoid bone right so if you remember here there was a membrane anteriorly what is that membrane thyrohyoid membrane thyrohyoid membrane we already learned there are two apertures over on the both sides through this we have already studied superior laryngeal van will enter through this apertures on either side right vein artery nerve vein artery nerve will enter inside so this nerve which is entering inside is nothing but your internal branch of sln okay the external branch will come down and it will supply the cricothyroid muscle over here right okay so that is how your musculature is applied so you can see here the recurrent sorry the sln division is over external branch supplying the cricothyroid and internal branch going inside and supplying the mucosa right clear okay internal branch below the level of the vocal cord is supplying the mucosa and if you see the other branch that is your recurrent laryngeal nerve see on the left side the recurrent laryngeal nerve is a bit lengthier than the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve on the right side why this is called as recurrent laryngeal recurrent means it is going below the level of the vocal cord larynx and again coming up and it is supplying the vocal cords and your vocal cord musculature and larynx so as it is recurring as it is recurring again this is called as recurrent laryngeal nerve you can see here the recurrent laryngeal nerve on the left side is uh, recurring around the arch of aorta this is your arch of aorta around the arch of aorta this has to recur on the left side so obviously it has to travel a longer distance okay so in this distance any pathologies over here can cause the compression over your recurrent laryngeal nerve or even here you have your atrium right right atrial hypertrophy will uh, compress the left recurrent laryngeal nerve that is called as in such conditions the patient will have hoarse voice that condition is called as Ortner syndrome okay cardiac pathology right atrial hypertrophy will cause hoarseness of voice due to left recurrent laryngeal nerve compression so that you call it as hoarseness the patient will be complaining of hoarseness of voice and if you do a uh, uh, is, uh, if you do a clinical examination and if you go for investigation thing the patient cardiac investigations will reveal the right atrial hypertrophy compressing the left recurrent laryngeal nerve in these cases 
right whereas on the right side you can see it is rotate recurring around the right subclavian artery okay on the right side it is recurring around the right subclavian artery so obviously your subclavian will be lying above the level of the arch of head right so the right is recurring around here once these two nerves recur they will lie in between the trachea and esophagus you can see here this is the trachea and this is the esophagus see in the tracheoesophageal groove your recurrent laryngeal nerve is running upward okay to supply the muscles of larynx see here the recurrent laryngeal nerve has come up and now it is supplying the internal muscles of the larynx right so which all muscles it will supply all muscles except the cricothyroid which is supplied by the ebsln and also above the level of the vocal cord uh, this rln will be supplied right okay clear i think i have gone uh, made a mistake here rln will supply below and sln will supply above because you can see here the sln is coming from the above and it will be supplying the above part the rln will be coming from below and it will be supplying the below part okay above and below okay i'm sorry right so coming to the next part okay and coming to the next uh, this one okay uh, we have a next part that is your ah uh, yes vocal cord palsy okay so this is very important topic so please remember this is very important the nerve supply is very important this table is very important okay either you by heart or you uh, remember either you by heart or you uh, remember by anatomy okay so this table is very important remember okay so simple so this is your larynx okay sorry superior and recurrent will be there okay so above it will be internally it will be sln and below internally it will be by rln apart from this mucosa it will be supplying the SLN will be supplying the cricothyroid, RLN will be supplying all other. Okay, this is very simple. Now, coming to the vocal cord palsy. Okay, so one by one, we will come to various different conditions of the vocal cord palsy. So, of the vocal cord palsy, the first condition is unilateral SLN and RLN palsy. Okay unilateral sln and rln palsy so this is the first condition as you all know what exactly is the superior laryngeal nerve supply cricothyroid muscle and mucosa above the level of vocal cord right above the vocal cord level mucosa and rln what is rln supplying all muscles except cricothyroid and mucosa below the level that means if you take larynx on a sides one side both motor and sensory is lost completely okay one side completely motor and sensory is lost in unilateral case okay one side right so what exactly is happening here if one side sensation is lost if this is the larynx from top to bottom right okay and one side this your uh, one side mucosal sensation is lost over here okay so the risk of aspiration will be minimal here because on the other side it is intact on the pathology side it is lost as one side is intact the partial aspiration risk will be there because the sensation of the mucosa is lost whenever food particles enter into your larynx that mucosa should be intact the uh, nerve supply should be intact in the mucosa they detect uh, on very uh, uh, very moment uh, the foreign body or the food material touches the larynx it should be able to initiate a very strong cough reflex so that that particle is uh, omitted outside with the help of cough but one side if it is not there definitely there is a partial chance of getting aspirated and the other side is intact so 
there is equally chances for not to getting aspirated okay so in case of unilateral sln and rln palsy partial aspiration risk is present okay so in this what happens all the uh, muscles are all the intrinsic muscles are paralyzed all except the cricothyroid as well as cricothyroid that means on one side all muscles are paralyzed so uh, if all the muscles are paralyzed the paralyzed vocal cord will lie in the cadaveric position intermediate position right okay so in the cadaver the paralyzed vocal cord remember because in cadaver everything is in paralysis but here as one side is paralyzed on one side there will be the uh, vocal cord will be lying in cadaveric position on the other side it will be moving normal if you take this vocal cord position this will be lying like this and this will be lying like this right so if this is left is paralyzed right so in this case what happens okay cadaveric position what is this exactly cadaveric position means this is exactly 3.5 millimeters away from the midline that is cadaveric position so this much of long distance whenever one side vocal cord is paralyzed not moving the other side is moving your body has got a compensatory mechanisms everywhere the other side vocal cord will try to compensate the gap and it will try to close but here what is this happening here it is lying very long distance away it is not lying in a paramedian position it is lying in a cadaveric position 3.5 millimeters away the opposite vocal cord cannot compensate this much long distance okay so what happens how much it tries it cannot compensate always whenever the patient tries to speak there will be a gap in the between the both vocal cords air leak will be there through the glottis or through the vocal cords and uh, the patient as there is air leak patient will be having a breathy voice here okay remember initially where we have studied about the breathy voice abductor dysphonia where both the muscles are abducted and in the spasmodic position right there they cannot adapt and they cannot close the glottis while speaking so their air leak is present and patient will be having a breathy voice in similarly here only one side vocal cord is moving the other side vocal cord is paralyzed and lying in cadaveric position opposite the vocal cord cannot compensate that much long distance as it is lying in cadaveric position not in paramedian so here what happens how much even it tries to compensate still there lies a somewhat gap in between the two vocal cords such that air leak will happen and the patient will get a breathy voice okay the treatment for this condition is medialization thyroplasty or medialization thyroplasty or it is ishiki type 1 thyroplasty there are four types of ishiki thyroplasty medialization, medialization lateralization shortening lengthening okay four types of thyroplasty so of which first one is medialization thyroplasty or medialization laryngoplasty here, for in case of unilateral SLN and RLN palsy, the paralyzed vocal cords needs to be medialized such that it comes towards the medial position and lies like that, such that the opposite vocal cord can easily, while phonation, it can easily touch the uh, medialized vocal cord and can again produce the voice normally. So that is about your unilateral SLN and RLN palsy. Now we will come to another one more condition that is your unilateral rln palsy okay unilateral rln palsy here only rln is paralyzed but not sln okay oh, so just think uh, if only rln is paralyzed means one side all intrinsic muscles are paralyzed except cricothyroid means cricothyroid is a tensor that pulls the vocal cords together right so <clears throat> when this cricothyroid is intact the difference between this condition and this condition is that here the cricothyroid is intact it pulls the vocal cord a bit nearer towards the midline so what happens the vocal cord will come to lie in a paramedian position so the paralyzed vocal cord will lie in a paramedian position and coming to the sensory supply 
you know above the level of the vocal cords both the sides it is supplied by sln so here there is no sln palsy the sensation is intact so no aspiration risk here okay no aspiration risk here and only one side rln is paralyzed okay only one side rln is paralyzed the vocal cord which comes to lie in paramedian position okay because the sln is intact over here the cricothyroid is intact the cricothyroid will pull a bit uh, vocal cord a bit medially okay so this will come to lie in paramedian position which is just 1.5 millimeters away from the midline this much distance uh, the opposite vocal cord can compensate so the opposite vocal cord can cross the midline and touch the paralyzed vocal cord which is lying in paramedian position 1.5 mm away but not cadaveric position which is 3.5 mm away so there you have to medialize but here there is no need for medialization only just wait and watch through over a period of time the opposite vocal cord will compensate and it the vocal phonation will get normalized slowly okay right so here unilateral rln palsy only there is no voice problem no voice problem no aspiration risk okay so mcq can be no voice problem and no aspiration risk can be seen in so condition that is unilateral rln palsy so now we will come to the next condition now again next condition hope you are all able to follow unilateral sln palsy so again simple again just think uh, so here one side sln means cricothyroid is paralyzed on one side right okay so cricothyroid is paralyzed on one side and one side the laryngeal mucosa is paralyzed here it is normal here one side it is paralyzed so again here partial aspiration risk is there okay not total aspiration risk partial aspiration risk is there right clear as cricothyroid that is keeping the vocal cord tensed is the function of the cricothyroid if this tensing function is lost the cricothyroid will become it should it won't be tight it will be a bit floppy it will be a bit bowed in appearance <coughs> sorry it will be a bit bored in appearance and it will be a bit floppy in appearance so the vocal cord the paralyzed vocal cord sir paralyzed vocal cord will be bored and floppy right clear so this is about your unilateral sln palsy okay so what happens in the process to compensate initially both vocal cords should be like this so the paralyzed vocal cord will become a bit bored but this will be normal so what happens in the process to compensate this middle gap okay where due to bowing of the vocal cord the middle gap is there so what happens the opposite vocal cord will move the posterior glottis moves towards the normal side okay so in a process to compensate what happens this will try to move this side and as a rebound this will come towards this side so the paralyzed vocal cord will come so at the end of the day the rotation of the glottis will happen in this direction okay okay so the paralyzed side will be posterior part of the paralyzed side will be moving towards the normal side and this condition is called this position is called as q position of the glottis as q position of the glottis here the risk of aspiration is low okay and the treatment is again conservative only wait and watch slowly it will get okay the vocal cord will get compensating the gap middle gap present over here due to bowing of the cricothyroid paralysis but what happens the vocal cords the structure larynx will be a bit uh, rotated towards the paralyzed anterior bit will be paralyzed toward moving towards the paralyzed side and the posterior will be moving towards the normal side if right uh, sln is paralyzed this will be the position if left sln is paralyzed this will be the position <coughs> sorry so the vocal the vocal function will be slowly getting compensated by the normal cord and it will become normal the risk of aspiration is partial so here no surgical intervention and coming to the 
Next condition. So this is important. Bilateral. Now we are coming to till now we have studied about unilateral. Now we are studying about bilateral RLN and SLN policy. Okay. So what's happening? As you all know, so both all entire muscles in the vocal cord are paralyzed. Means just like a dead body. Okay. So that is the vocal cord muscles are died. Simple. Only the vocal cord. So what happens? Cadaveric position will be occupied by both the vocal cords. Both vocal cords will be here lying in paramedian position. Right? Clear? As you know, and both sides SLN is also paralyzed. Again, if you see this is the vocal cord level. Above the level of vocal cord, both sides is supplied by your SLN. So this side, this SLN. So both are paralyzed. Okay, so there is no sensation over here. Whenever a foreign particle comes, nothing here detects the foreign body entry and uh, there is no cough reflex. The foreign body may directly go into your airway so the risk of aspiration is very high okay aspiration pneumonitis can happen in these cases okay so the risk of aspiration is very high both vocal cords will also be lying in the instead of lying in their mouth they will be lying in the paramedian position 3.5 mm away from the midline on both sides okay so here the important surgery to be done here is what we do see you all know anteriorly the windpipe Posteriorly the foot pipe, right? Esophagus and trachea will be lying over here, right? So this is the larynx above, right? Okay. So this is the arrangement. This will go into the stomach. Okay. Okay. This will go into stomach and this air will go into your airway, right? Okay. So here as there is a high risk of aspiration and lungs getting infected most commonly and there is a risk to the patient's life, danger uh, to the patient's life, what we do is we divert this trachea into the esophagus and uh, we put a permanent tracheostomy tube over here okay tracheostomy will be done and see what happens at the end of the day okay so the trachea will be opening into your esophagus so whatever aspirated food material comes over here this will again go into your esophagus only and then into your stomach okay and uh, here the remaining of the uh, airway here we have made a permanent tracheostome, right? Okay. We have made a permanent tracheostome over here. Okay. And this will be going into your lungs, right? Okay. Okay. So the tracheostomy tube will be present all throughout this. And here the vocal cords are there earlier. So the voice is completely lost, permanently lost voice over here. The patient will lose his voice permanently over here. In case of bilateral RLN and SLN palsy, only here you are providing a life saving procedure to the patient. Okay, right. Next, next condition this uh, surgery is called as tracheoesophageal diversion. Okay, we call this procedure as tracheoesophageal diversion because whatever aspirated content that comes inside the trachea will again be directed towards the esophagus with the help of this attachment okay with tracheoesophageal diversion with the permanent tracheostome okay next come to the next condition okay bilateral rln palsy this is most dangerous situation bilateral sln policy okay see here earlier we have studied about unilateral rln policy what exactly is happening? Vocal cord is coming and lying in the paramedian position on the paralyzed side. And on the other side, due to the <coughs> normal functioning cord is present, uh, vocal cord is present. Why it is lying in the paramedian position? Because the cricothyroid pull is present here. Because SLN is not paralyzed over here. The cricothyroid pull is pulling the vocal cord from intermediate to paramedian position. Right? Right? Okay. And now, in case of bilateral SL and palsy, so bilateral vocal cords will be lying in the paramedian position. Simple. Right? So bilateral vocal cords will be lying in the paramedian position. That means both will be lying like this and there is no movement. Okay? Both are paralyzed. Means from the midline, 
this side 1.5 mm and this side 1.5 mm that means only 3 mm gap is present and through the 3 mm gap patient has to take breath that means airway narrowing is present which is very dangerous airway compromise is present over here okay so in these cases you have to go for a emergency tracheostomy emergency tracheostomy needs to be done and uh, after six months after if still the condition is not getting resolved you have to go for a permanent lateralization procedure okay if the vocal cord is lateralized you will do a medialization procedure if the vocal cord is medialized you will do a lateralization procedure right so permanent lateralization procedure should be planned which involves of which one is kashima's procedure okay so kashima procedure means posterior transverse chordotomy you have both vocal cords over here okay larynx okay all the laryngeal musculature will be present over here so this is the only airway present you cut the vocal cord over here posterior transverse chordotomy what happens next the airway will become like this okay so at least this much of airway you are giving to the patient but here the voice is lost or you have to go for a arytenoidectomy here arytenoids will be lying posteriorly the arytenoids if you completely remove then the patient will be getting the come enough adequate airway through the posterior glottis okay so there is a hypothesis proposed by Wagner and Grossman. Wagner and Grossman hypothesis says that intact cricothyroid pulls vocal cord into paramedian position that we have already seen because one side if all the muscles get paralyzed the vocal cord will lie in cadaveric position if only Recurrent laryngeal nerve gets paralyzed, but superior laryngeal nerve is intact. That means cricothyroid is intact. It will pull the vocal cord into paramedian position. At 2 mm medially, it will pull so that the vocal cord will be lying in paramedian uh, position. Okay. So, in case of unilateral RLN palsy, this was uh, there was no problem because only one side vocal cord is lateralized, other side vocal cord is moving. So when it is moving, when you are breathing in, your vocal cords will be uh, lateralized. That means the normal side will be lateralized. Adequate airway will be present. But, but when both vocal cords, both RLNs are paralyzed, what happens? The both will be fixed in that position. Nothing is going to move away when you breathe in. So that 3 mm gap is not at all sufficient for the lungs to get uh, ventilated. So immediate patient will be in gasping condition. First, do immediate emergency tracheostomy and provide adequate airway first and then after wait for six months later on and if the patient is not getting normalized, the vocal cords are not getting normalized even later on, then go for the permanent lateralization procedures. That is one is Kashima's procedure or <coughs> other one is arytenoidectomy. So, both one of both procedures can be planned in both of them voice compromise will be there. And the last condition, one more condition left is your bilateral SLN palsy. This is very dangerous even because here you see both sides SLN palsy is there right. That means everywhere your mucosa is lost. The sensory supply to the mucosa is lost. So risk of aspiration is very high. So which can cause again aspiration pneumonitis. So, so in, there should be a life saving procedure done. So what happens? Okay, we will do here. So as you know, epiglottis will be there. So we will close the laryngeal inlet completely with epiglottoplexy or supraglottoplasty to avoid the food particle entering into the airway and we put a permanent tracheostomy down, okay, to provide the airway, okay. So here, uh, coming to the motor, bilateral vocal cords will become floppy okay so bilateral vocal cords will be becoming floppy and uh, so during phonation this will be very weakly vibrating as if a senile an old person is speaking okay the timber of the voice is lost the integrity the stiffness of the voice is lost so the vocal fatigue will be there as just an old man voice will be there to these patients in case of bilateral SLN palsy 
but still as the risk of aspiration is high you better go for a tracheostomy and do an a supraglottoplasty close the upper part of the airway to avoid unnecessary aspiration and at least at the cost of the voice you can save the life of the patient okay clear so hope this is all about your uh, the vocal cord palsy so total six conditions in unilateral both sln and rln only sln only rln again coming to bilateral both only sln only rln so according to their supply if you know their normal supply you can easily get what happening exactly there in the moment it's okay you, you need not buy heart everything right clear so now coming to ishiki's thyroplasty so coming to ishiki's thyroplasties so thyroplasty or laryngoplasty okay plasty means restructuring the lost shape or lost structure or lost function and so thyro here we are operating or laryngo we are operating on the larynx so that's why it is thyroplasty or laryngoplasty there are four types of ishiki's thyroplasty the first is medialization lateralization shortening and lengthening we all know till now we have been studying about the medialization and lateralization where exactly everything is required we know and now coming to the shortening and the lengthening of procedures where exactly this required is puberphonia puberphonia means adolescent male speaking as a female why this happens the shortening okay shortening procedures why this happens is see if a female voice will be having high frequency okay high frequency high frequency voice will be seen in females and males will be having a low frequency if you pull it the, the rope a uh, thread tightly and just make it vibrate it will vibrate with a high frequency right but if you keep it loose and if you make it vibrate it will vibrate with a low frequency right so in females the vocal cords are stretched and in males the vocal cords are a bit loose comparably so that makes the males a bit low pitch voice and females high pitch voice so in case of adolescent males the vocal cords should be loosely kept but instead what is happening exactly in them the vocal cords are tightly kept tightly stretched so in these patients to detect clinically exactly whether the patient is having a problem of puberphonia or not gutsman pressure test is done okay what is this gutsman pressure test simple see you all know this is your thyroid okay and this is your cricoid lying down like this here you have your arytenoid vocal process and this is your vocal cord attached like this so here vocal cord in puberphonia condition in males which should be a bit loosely attached is tightly attached so that there is a high frequency voice is coming from a male so that is puberphonia when it is tightly stretched a female voice is coming if you make it loosely stretched then a male voice may come so ask the patient to put the pressure on the thyroid cartilage back and ask him to speak you can see my voice also when i am putting pressure see if you can make a difference when i am putting pressure on my vocal cord see on my thyroid cartilage even my vocal cord still becomes much less and more low frequency more uh, kind of male voice will come <coughs> okay so if i am putting pressure from here from the anterior side on the thyroid what happens this will make that tightly stretched a vocal cord a bit loose to uh come okay it will become a bit loose so that the patient will be once pressing the thyroid and while speaking the patient will be getting a male voice okay so that is called as gutsman pressure test which confirms the condition as only puberphonia not other condition so in such cases what you will do you will do a shortening procedure right okay so you will cut a bit of the vocal uh, thyroid cartilage here and you will rotate it and you will place it at the back so that is a procedure detailed procedure not required at your level so that is short shortening procedure is done in puberphonia again no need to buy heart why shortening of the vocal cord needs to be done is 
the tension, the pressure, the stretch inside the vocal cord needs to be decreased so that it vibrates with a low frequency, which is a male voice. Clear? And similarly, the inverse is true for androphonia, where a female gets a male voice. So here, the vocal cord, instead of lying in a stretched taut position, is lying in a loosely stretched position. So here, you have to lengthen the vocal cord where the attachment of the vocal cord is there to thyroid cartilage, cut that strip and pull it anteriorly and rotate it and place it in the there. So there, that way you can do a lengthening procedure that is an androphonia, you can see this, that is lengthening procedures can be done, right? So this is all about your ischiakis ish thyroplasties, okay? Clear? And next coming, uh, next one more condition you are having is you might have noticed if any females are there here mostly middle-aged stressed females will be facing this condition functional aphonia okay okay nothing it is just a functional okay it is just functional psychological here muscles are normal nerves are normal but voice is not there Everything is normal, but output is not there. No voice is there. That is functional aphonia. This is most common in emotionally labile female. Gar mein kuch gadbad ho gaya, to ho jata hai. Immediately a jata. So if any uh, stress, tensions, more psychological tensions are there, okay, in those you will see this condition. Okay, on mostly in females of 20 to 30 years commonly seen this condition. Okay, so when you are doing a laryngoscopy in these cases, ask a patient to talk, there won't be any vocal cord movement, but you ask the patient to cough, there the vocal cord movement will be there. Okay, on phonation, on voice, no vocal cord movement, but on cough, there is movement if it is a if there is any lesion really then there should not be any even if the patient tries to cough also there should not be any vocal cord movement because when your muscles are paralyzed when your nerve supply is lost where can you move the vocal cord so it's not possible so the treatment for this is just counseling and if still if not then speech therapy can be given right so that condition is called as functional aphonia and now coming to the next condition that is vocal cord structure okay so if you come to the vocal cord structure you have got five layers okay so just going through quickly going through the outer layer is the epithelial layer okay the outer layer is the simple epithelial layer squamous epithelium okay and the inside three layers of lamina propria will be there of the three layers of the lamina propria the second is the superficial lamina propria and the third is the middle lamina propria and the fourth is the inner lamina propria or deep lamina propria okay superficial middle deep this forms the second third and fourth layers of the lamina propria and the fifth layer is the muscular layer formed by thyroarytenoid and vocalis so not much important for your level that is fine we can go for towards the next thing just remember how many layers are there in vocal cord structure there are five layers, okay? So this is the endoscopic picture of a vocal cord. You can see the, the larynx, you can see the vocal cords over whitish structures lying over here, lined by simple squamous epithelium. All other uh, mucosa is lined by uh, respiratory type of epithelium, okay? And coming to the functions of the larynx, okay? What are the functions of the larynx? The first one is comes to your mind immediately is phonation, okay? And during expiration only you can do phonation. The other thing is, okay, it acts as a conduct of passage for the respiration, for the air to go and uh, come. And uh, while climbing and swimming, fixation of chest, okay? You have to close your glottis while climbing and uh, swimming. So that way you can build up the pressure inside, okay? Fixation of chest while climbing and uh, swimming, okay? So in those patients where laryngectomy is done, they cannot climb, they cannot swim. Remember this point, where fixation of chest can't be done. So in while climbing up, you should hold your breath. In order to hold your breath, you should close the glottis. You should not allow the air to leak outside. If laryngectomy is done, you can't do that. 
and uh, those patients cannot climb or cannot swim and also the other thing is protection of lower airways very important because if upper uh, there is no sensory intact sensory supply in the upper laryngeal mucosa then respiration of food contents can occur and your lungs can get pneumonitized right and there will be a problem later right so coming to the conditions of the vocal cord first condition is benign lesions of the vocal cord vocal cord nodules okay most commonly these are seen in professional voice users singers screamers teachers okay factory workers okay you can see this condition in mostly in them because they need to use their voice most so that is your vocal cord nodules okay so most commonly vocal cord nodules will be bilateral you can see this will be bilateral and this will be less than 0.3 mm in diameter okay the treatment is only speech therapy for vocal nodules not surgery okay see simply remember vocal nodules like this okay and remember vocal polyps like this this will be bilateral and less than 0.3 mm and vocal polyps will be mostly unilateral and more than 0.3 mm in diameter the pathogenesis the pathology will be same only okay in both nodules and polyps this is vocal cord polyp okay here surgical excision is required okay here you have to go for a surgical excision in case of vocal cord polyp okay the most common site for either nodule or polyp is again is very important mcq anterior one third and posterior two third the junction of anterior one third and posterior two third that is the most common location of a vocal cord polyp or vocal cord nodule okay right you can see the surgical steps over here so is there we are removing the vocal cord polyp contents and we are replacing the mucosa excessive mucosa is being trimmed and replaced okay and coming to the other next condition is rinkis edema or smoker's polyp in this rinkis edema is most commonly seen in smokers okay this is also called as smoker's polyp or this is also called as polypoid corditis the cord itself will appear as a polyp so that is called as uh, <coughs> polypoid corditis okay what happens here is there is a space called in between the you already have studied the there are five layers in a vocal cord outer epithelial layer and inner lamina propria having three layers right so there will be three layers of the lamina propria this entire thing is lamina propria here the space between this lamina propria and the epithelial layer is the rinky space okay in this rinky space so what exactly is the rinky space the there is uh, the space between the epithelial layer and the uh, lamina propria that is the rinky space here there will be edema okay edema will happen here in this rinky space in case of vocal cord in, in case of smokers which we call it as rinky edema so the vocal folds vocal cords will become bulky due to the edema and they cannot vibrate with that frequency okay that effectively they cannot vibrate they as the patient tries to speak even he cannot speak that actively the vocal cords immediately due to their bulkiness cannot vibrate with that particular consistency so the patient will be having a vocal fatigue okay so here you can see a vocal fatigue will be the complaint of the patient okay right okay again treatment is microlaryngeal surgery excision okay excision of open the layer epithelial layer excise all the contents inside and approximate the epithelial layer and here comes your arytenoid granuloma or vocal cord granuloma he this is most commonly vocal cord granuloma or this is also called as intubation granuloma because this most hap commonly happens due to intubation trauma okay so here <coughs> uh, what happens is there from the posterior cordis whenever this is your vocal cords whenever there is intubation here here you will be having arytenoids right so mostly whenever you intubate 
the tube will be passing occupying the posterior glottis area. So due to constant rubbing in the posterior glottis area at the side of the arytenoids, what happens here, whichever side it is rubbing more due to unnecessary prolonged intubation patients, you can see ICU admitted patients, <coughs> sorry, in ICU admitted patients, uh, wherever there is a prolonged intubation, continuous unnecessary movements, manipulations of the intubation, intubator, endotracheal tube, ETT. So there happens the constant rubbing frictional granulation tissue forms near the arytenoid cartilage that is the junction where the vocal cord uh, starts from the uh, that muscular uh, vocal process of the arytenoid cartilage from there this tissue starts appearing and that is called as your vocal cord granuloma again the treatment will be surgical excision okay mls microlaryngeal surgery excision will be done in these cases this is even also seen in lpr laryngopharyngeal reflex cases also you can see the posterior glot is most commonly because if you see the endoscopic picture of the larynx, okay, where is that endoscopic? If you see this endoscopic picture, see this at uh, this area, mostly the intubation granuloma or the vocal cord granulomas will form. See, this is esophagus. In case of laryngopharyngeal reflux, the acid content will be coming from the esophagus side and they will be falling on the posterior glottis, okay. And constantly the acidic contents will be irritating the posterior parts of the glottis and due to that acidic irritation of the posterior glottis, the granulomas may form over here. Those are called as vocal cord granulomas, clear, okay. So that's why you see them in the posterior. Typically, they are bilobed in appearance, right, okay. Next, coming to the next, next condition, that is your leukoplakia, which is a pre-malignant condition any whitish patch in the mucosa which is otherwise diagnosed can be taken as leukoplakia any whitish patch unless until diagnosed as any other particular lesion till that time that it can be diagnosed it can be labeled as leukoplakia okay what happens in case of leukoplakia excessive keratin gets deposed as it is a squamous epithelium but non-keratinizing type Dysplasia can occur sometimes, that is carcinoma precancerous changes and uh, that changes that non-keratinized form will change into keratinized form and keratin gets deposited sometimes on the vocal cord surface. That condition is called as leukoplakia which is a pre-malignant condition, okay. And the treatment is again excision and biopsy, okay. Excision biopsy is done generally for these cases, right. And coming to the next condition, that is your acute epiglottitis. Acute epiglottitis or supraglottitis. Sorry. So, acute epiglottitis. Okay. So, just a small two minute break. Sorry. Just a two, small two minute break.
okay sorry for the short disturbance so coming back into the class let us start discussion on the acute epiglottitis okay this condition is most commonly this condition is seen in two to seven years old children okay so what happens here the most common organism is hemophilus influenzae b okay so these are all to be uh, by hearted okay so main clinical features here will be strider okay that strider will be mostly of inspiratory type okay and so acute onset the patient will be due to the virulence of the infecting organism there will be acute onset of high grade fever okay high grade fever will be there of acute onset and uh, the patient will be very difficult having difficulty in swallowing so there will be drooling of saliva will be there so this is about acute epiglottitis okay so instead of rather than supine position instead of sleeping patient tries to prefers to sit uh, prefer the sitting position okay so that is you can see here in case of this condition okay and he always tries to lean forward okay so he tries to sit and on his legs and he tries to lean forward this is called as tripod sign so tripod sign is seen in acute epiglottitis so on examination you can see the epiglottis because it is only epiglottitis it will be very red and swollen okay red and swollen epiglottis will be sign and uh, if you see direct because children will be having a bit high like larynx so the epiglottis will be already on the higher position so what happens on the, on the from behind the tongue if you see from anterior you put a tongue depressor and depress the tongue and see behind the reddish epiglottis structure will be sign they will be seen rising from beyond just like a sun rising in the reddish color in the early morning so this we call it as a rising sun appearance okay rising sun sign okay so tripod sign because the patient the child tries to prefers to sit rather than lying in a supine position and he tries to lean forward that is called as tripod sign as the epiglottis is red and swollen and it will be from behind it will be appearing like a reddish structure arising from below that is uh, similar to a rising sun it is called as rising sun appearance okay so on x-ray if you see the epiglottis usually which you sh which should be lying like this this should be this is swollen okay swollen epiglottis will be appearing like this so this will appear as your thumb sign okay thumb this will appear as your thumb just like like this okay on lateral x-ray remember this can be seen on a lateral x-ray neck okay not on the anterior because your epiglottis will be arising like this from the thyroid posterior surface right it will be lying back if you see from the sideways only you will be able to notice this thumb sign like this okay right so the treatment will be again first admit the patient give antibiotics okay intravenous fluids adequate intravenous fluids because the child will be facing very difficulty in swallowing okay he can't move his swollen and reddish inflamed epiglottis okay he can't move his larynx okay while swallowing so he prefers not to swallow not to move and not to talk or not to eat so what happens here you have to provide the alternate iv root iv fluids and also so give adequate steroid inhalational steroids are preferred because unnecessary when high grade fevers are there so better to avoid systemic steroids and also you can with the help of a nebulizer you can give a steroids also okay so this is all about epiglottitis the points needs to be remembered most common in two to seven year old, old. hemophilus influenza b hiv is the commonest organism due to the virulence of this organism acute onset of high fever will be there drooling of saliva because patient won't be able to swallow his own saliva it will be painful to swallow so the patient will be having a drooling of saliva as this there is a due to the swelling of the epiglottis the upper airway is narrowed there will be only inspiratory strider 
okay if the lower airway is involved there will be expiratory if the middle part of the airway is involved or subglottic area or upper tracheal part there will be both inspiratory as well as expiratory strider will be there in general okay so rising sun appearance tripod side and thumb side all these are seen in your acute epiglottitis condition and coming to your next condition that is your so <coughs> croup okay so this is also one of the most commonly seen condition in pediatric hospitals the croup this is acute laryngotracheobronchitis ltbi larynx trachea bronchial infection is there okay croup is acute laryngotracheobronchitis that means throughout the airway your larynx okay where your vocal cords are present larynx okay and trachea and both the bronchi are involved Okay, so this entire part is in no infected. Here, the most common site will be subglottis. Subglottis will be the most common site. This is most commonly seen in three months to six year old children. Okay, so here the most common organism is para influenzae virus. Okay, para influenzae one and two are most common over here causing. Here, the typical sign you see is barking cough, right? The cough appears like a, hears like a bark of a dog. Okay, we also call this group because as the larynx is involved, the vocal cords are involved, there will be a barking cough, okay? So, croupy cough, we call it as, okay? Our hoarseness of voice will also be there along with the cough, okay? The cough will be appearing in a different sound than that of the patient's original sound okay so here you can see very rise temp temperature that is fever can be seen over here the, on x-ray you can see here steeple sign okay what is this steeple sign exactly okay again steeple sign here is seen on anterior posterior view not on lateral view see what happens you can notice here the airway which is due to the uh, here when you come with this part where subglottis is lying what happens this is your airway, right? Okay. The mucosal lining normally will be lying like this. Most common here, the vocal cords are there. The subglottis part is most commonly involved. The other part is very less frequently, less commonly involved, less severely involved. So the edema will be more in the subglottic area. Okay. In the subglottic narrowing will be more when compared to the lower. So this sign, okay, this sign will appear as a steeple. You can see here like a steeple it appears like okay you can see here it is this is the steeple sign so this we call it as a steeple sign hope you are able to follow right this can be seen on the ap view of the neck okay steeple sign whenever a three months to six years old children are presenting to you with a gradually increasing fever okay and uh, now you are able to hear both inspiratory and expiratory strider as well then you have to suspect something involving both upper airway as well as lower airway or most commonly subglottis may be involved here and you have to go for a uh, x-ray AP view and in that if you see a steeple side you can confirm the crew and you can start your regular antibiotic treatment right I think an adequate uh, steroid nebulization will be so okay next coming to the laryngeal diphtheria Okay, next coming to the condition called as laryngeal diphtheria. Okay, laryngeal diphtheria, there is a grayish white pseudo membrane will be formed. Okay, a grayish white pseudo membrane will you can see a grayish white pseudo membrane formed over here. okay so that is called as uh, this, this condition laryngeal diphtheria we notice a grayish white pseudo membrane which bleeds on removal okay so this is in this condition you will be seeing uh, cervical lymphadenopathy all the lymph nodes will be enlarged the causating organism will be you know corinibacterium diphtheriae so you have to take a throat swab and send it for culture sensitivity and if you are suspecting any bull neck and a grayish white membrane just rub your throat swab on the layer and send it for culture sensitivity and mention to look for corneobacteria and uh, 
the treatment will be diphtheria antitoxin needs to be given immediately okay and other conservative management accordingly so when there is a swelling inside edema completely edematous airway strider may be there narrowing of the airway may be there inhalation of steroids okay along with bronchodilators needs to be given in the nebulized form okay but so these are some other conditions where we are discussing another condition is laryngeal tuberculosis okay most common form of extra pulmonary tuberculosis laryngeal tuberculosis you all know the causating organism is mycobacterium tuberculosis okay here as you know the airway is present like this and uh, most of the times the primary source of the okay the primary source of your here your vocal cords are there the secretions coming from the lungs will be touching the inferior surface most commonly here the infected organisms will be touching the inferior surface most commonly so the lesions in case of laryngeal tuberculosis will be most commonly lying on the inferior surface of the vocal cord okay so most commonly if you take uh, the posterior glottis is wide so the most commonly the posterior glottis will be most commonly involved compared to anterior okay and uh, there will be mucosal ulcerations will be there you can see the ulcerated form of the entire vocal fold mucosal ulcerations uh, which are painful okay here it is a painful condition not painless painful okay so on <coughs> direct laryngoscopy you can see a mouse nibbled appearance of the vocal cords and the epiglottis is swollen and it looks like a turban okay just like a hat you are sitting on the top of the larynx so this is also called as turban epiglottis okay turban epiglottis can be seen okay and uh, your mouse nibbled appearance of the vocal cord is seen in here in case of laryngeal tuberculosis the treatment is only anti tubercular treatment for six months if there is no primary tuberculosis found in lungs if it is only an extra pulmonary tuberculosis diagnosed then you can give a six months course of anti tubercular therapy ATT and then it will be fine okay so <coughs> coming to the next condition that is your differences between okay adult and pediatric larynx okay you can see see the luminal uh, shape here in case of adult is cylindrical can you see that it is cylindrical like but here it is like a conical okay clear you can clearly see there is a conical okay or a funnel shape like a funnel like right? and the position of the uh, here it will be a c3 to c6 whereas in children it will be near some c1 c2 high lying larynx will be seen in case of children high lying larynx this is the reason why children can simultaneously uh, so take feeds while breathing also okay so while breathing at the same time they can breathe or at the same at the same time they can swallow the fluids okay milk okay and the epiglottis here is uh, obviously rigid in adult whereas it will be a bit flaccid in children obviously when you are born all the cartilages will be a bit uh, weaker only as you grow as you age they will be becoming there will be ossification process going on and they will be becoming stronger okay and the thyroid cartilage is like a shield like over here okay thyroid in, in adult is described as a shield like cartilage but in case of uh, children it is it is a bit flat okay and arytenoids are also rigid flaccid again these are rigid and flaccid over here mucosa is a bit loose lax whereas it's a bit tight over in children okay and the narrowest part in case of adults is glottis where vocal cords lie this is but in case of children the narrowest part due to conical shape you know the uh, below the glottis only the subglottis will be lying so below the subglottis level is the narrowest part this is important mcq for you and this is one is uh, one more important mcq okay so this is most important right so this <coughs> okay then come coming to next condition what is that next condition yeah laryngomalacia okay what is this laryngomalacia most common congenital 
laryngeal anatomy is laryngomalacia most common congenital anomaly of larynx is laryngomalacia everywhere nowadays most commonly you can see very the newborn baby after one to two months will start having strider when the patient parent will come and he will be complaining that uh, we are hearing breathing sounds in our child is there any problem so the moment you hear it will be only inspiratory so that confirms there is a narrowing in the upper part of the airway what structures are present in the upper part of the airway supraglottis epiglottis forms the main part area epiglottic fold so how do you get a strider whenever there is a narrowing of the airway you will get a sound that you call it as a strider so if there is inspiratory strider only means there is a narrowing of the airway in the upper part of the airway so that means your uh, upper cartilages are getting collapsed easily okay so upper cartilages are getting collapsed easily means your epiglottis is very flaccid okay very much flaccid okay so this is the most as it is the most common congenital obviously this will be the most common cause of strider in children okay clear okay so more flaccid laryngeal cartilages will be there in this so more uh, collapse on inspiration as you know inspiration is a negative pressure lungs will suck the air inside whatever they want it is a passive process you are not going any to expend any of your energy on the inspiration but while expiration is an active process inspiration is a passive so due to negative pressure the lungs will pull the air as they are pulling the air inside the laryngeal wall in structure should be well rigid enough to withstand that negative pulling pressure if they are not that much rigid if they are flaccid collapsible they will easily come narrower and uh, they will come nearer and uh, they will block the air entry so there won't be adequate air entry into the child so on prone position the child will be comfortable in these situations okay in these conditions okay so due to flaccid so there will be collapse of the upper airway and uh, the, you will be hearing a strider inspiratory strider will be heard in these cases okay so you can wait and watch till two years okay the treatment will be so on examination when you put a laryngoscope and see inside there will be omega epiglottis will be there epiglottis will be omega shaped okay and <clears throat> in the array uh, epiglottic folds if you see posteriorly the arytenoids will be most prominently visible okay array epiglottic arytenoids will be more prominent okay so for the treatment for this is you can wait and watch till two years okay 99 percent of these conditions will get resolved on their own as a as a child uh, ages the ossification process will go on and the cartilages will be, uh, keep on getting rigid day by day and slowly this process will get cured on its own most of the times even after two years if this is not happening you have to go for a epiglottoplasty or supraglottoplasty. Then, and uh, coming to the next, see, you can see a omega shaped epiglottis over here. See, this is the uh, laryngoscopic picture showing that. So, the omega shaped uh, epiglottis can be seen over here. Okay. Next, coming to the next part. Okay. So, this is a laryngeal web persistent there is the luminization of the lumen formation of the lumen is impaired developmentally and there forms a laryngeal web anteriorly okay laryngeal web anteriorly due to the inadequate lumen formation during development okay so that we call it as laryngeal web okay so that this uh, treatment for this will be only surgical removal of the web okay you have to operate you have to remove the anterior lying web by surgery okay and then coming to the juvenile papillomatosis okay recurrent respiratory papillomatosis or juvenile papillomatosis okay so the most common cause hpv 6 and 11 mcq important hpv 6 and 11 and of this 11 will be if 11 is found maybe there may be a worse prognosis compared to hpv type 6 okay so most common side again when you go up to down supraglottis is most common okay followed by glottis and then subglottis okay 
so most common will be supraglottis only okay and coming to clinical obviously when there is a mass forming in the airway lumen there will be the airway obstruction will be there so breathing difficulty simple breathing difficulty will be there and if the papilloma forms on the glottis on the vocal cords okay in the glottis then the patient may even complain of hoarseness of voice remember one thing if a patient is having hoarseness of voice then there is definitely vocal cords are involved then only there will be hoarseness of voice voice changed means vocal cords are involved okay so remember one uh, point where everywhere this is applicable as a blind point okay and uh, so take a biopsy and send it for uh, histopathological examination okay and uh, later on plan for after confirmation surgical excision surgical excision of course this recurrence is very known issue here okay laser very uh, new methods are the laser debrider so that's a different issue okay so medically if you want to give interferon 2 alpha can be given and also 13 6 retinoic acid 13 6 retinoic acid is also used as a treatment and uh, nowadays intralesional intralesional sidofovir is being used to medically manage so there are some reports where they are successfully treated this condition with this intralesional injection of the sidofovir drug okay no no but in our setups usually we are going for complete surgical excision and coming to the next condition subglottic stenosis okay subglottic stenosis okay so what happens subglottic is one of the narrowest area in pediatric this is the most common narrow area most narrow area in the airway in adults glottis is the narrow airway after glottis subglottis is the narrow airway okay so here we do a grading cotton mayer grading is important for you this can be an mcq what cotton mayer grading says if it can be labeled as grade 1 if there is 0 to 50 percent of obstruction is there okay and if it is grade 2 if it is 51 to 79 if it is sorry 51 to 70 and if it is 71 to 99 it is grade 3 and grade 4 is complete obstruction okay this is the classification grading methods grading classification given by cotton mayer for subglottic stenosis obviously whenever there is uh, stenosis you have to excise you have to widen the lumen okay excision with you can use a laser okay or you can use a cold steel also okay for grade 1 and 2 you can go for a simple excision laser methods everything but for grade 3 and 4 where there is a very severe airway narrowing the patient cannot be uh, in grade 3 and 4 there is a most of the airway is compromised so immediately you have to go for immediate life-saving procedures like tracheostomy initially and then later on you can plan for resection and anastomosis okay like those things or a t-tube insertions can be done so that won't be required at your level so these are the treatments and coming to the carcinoma larynx okay so coming to the carcinoma larynx right next condition see larynx mostly seen in aged 50 to 70 year old aged people okay again most common causes will be addictions if a patient has a large huge history of smoking alcohol tobacco okay all those things are there then definitely the patient will be having a CL larynx the most common type will be squamous cell carcinoma so squamous cell carcinoma routinely whenever a patient comes to you 90 percent of the times you see everywhere you take a biopsy send it for a histopathological examination it will be squamous cell carcinoma always okay so these are the conditions in case of glottic cancer okay where in case of glottic cancer okay glottic cancer means cancel of the vocal cords okay as vocal cords are involved here the patient will be coming to you with hoarseness of the voice as okay so patient presents early here because slightest change in the vocal cord structure integrity will cause hoarseness so whenever the voice changes then only the patient feel that something is happening then immediately he will come to you so usually glottic carcinomas are diagnosed early okay these are early diagnosed 
So when they are early diagnosed, obviously the treatment will be started early. So when the treatment is started early, obviously the prognosis will be usually good. Another reason why the prognosis is good in gargloptic carcinoma is this is a watershed area. What happens is above the level of the lymph flow will be above the level of vocal cords will be flowing towards the upper group of lymph nodes. Below the level of vocal cords, the lymph flow will be towards the lower group of lymph nodes. So this area won't involve much of the lymph node. The spread will be very less. Okay, mostly not. So there will be. So lymphatics are very less in number here in case of glottis or vocal cord level. So this have they, these patients have a good prognosis, right? Okay, clear, right? Next, coming to the next condition. Okay, see, you can see here, see on the vocal cord itself, the structure is there, okay? The mass is there, the uh, cancer, right? Next, coming to the next uh, subglottis, okay? Coming to the, this is already we have studied, okay? Uh, now, coming to the subglottic carcinoma. Okay, so where is this? Coming to the subglottic carcinoma. Okay, coming to the subglottic carcinoma. As this is the narrowest area, you can see completely airway is getting compromised. So, patient will be having airway obstruction. Again, obstructive airway symptoms will be seen. Here, the prognosis will be poor. The spread will be there to the surrounding structures and it will be a... <coughs> very difficult to treat condition and coming to the stage 1 and 2 when if it is a stage 1 and 2 laryngeal carcinoma you can go for a radiotherapy in radiotherapy usually 66 gray of radiation dose is given that is divided in uh, 2 gray per day and that is given 5 days per week it is given okay this is given for six to seven weeks like that okay so in six to seven weeks uh, that will be 32 uh, six five are 30 30 to 35 days sir. so 35 days if you give two gray daily then it will be counting up to 60 gray so 66 gray in total the patient will should get a 66 gray of radiation okay in divided doses usually it is divided in this way right and in cases of stage three and four both radiotherapy plus chemotherapy will be given okay and if still not possible in stage 4 you may have to go for a laryngectomy okay complete laryngectomy will be done in case of stage 4 okay so after uh, laryngectomy if you remove the larynx what happens your vocal cords are gone then how the patient is going to get the voice so the <coughs> voice rehabilitation what are the methods of voice rehabilitation okay so there are different methods for voice rehabilitation one is esophageal speech do you put a diversion procedure from the trachea towards the esophagus to block the hole and try speaking through the esophagus okay try making sound through the esophagus burping speech will be there in these cases and another case is tracheoesophageal processes. We call it as TEP. Tracheoesophageal process. There are different kinds of tracheoesophageal processes present. One here shown is Bloomsinger processes or Groninger's processes or Provox processes. Different kinds of process processes are there. So tracheoesophageal processes. So insert this device and block and while speaking you block it and there will be a voice production through these devices. Another new coming is electrolarynx which itself lodges some vibrating structures inside and that will be producing whenever you have you have to implant the electrolarynx inside. Okay. So this is all about your voice rehabilitation post laryngectomy and coming to the tracheostomy. So we will discuss tracheostomy in the next class. Okay. In the end of the class. Okay. So hope the larynx part is over till now. Okay. So we have completed the larynx by now. And we will be giving you a notes. Okay, you can go through the notes. And any doubts, please let me know so that I am stopping the larynx here.